was a, it was a great show. How, how did you get involved with the show? Well, I auditioned for the show in New York, East Coast Girl, and I had um, just finished doing School Days mm-hmm. with Spike Lee. Casting director for School Days called a lot of us in from uh, School Days to audition for A Different World. So I went in and I had auditioned for A Different World before and had been rejected. So this time I I said, I'm not going to be myself because what I am isn't really cutting it. So, you know, I went in like this and they bought it. They thought that was your real. uh... No, they knew that wasn't my real accent. But when they saw it in the, the tape in L.A., they didn't know me at all. They didn't know me from Adam. But the New York casting people, Hughes Moss, they knew me. They had seen me on Broadway and stuff. So they were like. You know, well, she's going in like that. Well, good luck. No. <laughs> then I flew out, did the network thing, and I had um, for Friday. I I flew in Friday morning. I had a Friday audition. I had a Saturday audition, and I was at that time given a monologue. Now, mind you, I'd only done the accent with the sides that they had prepared for me. So I was like, oh, I gotta do other words with this accent and a monologue on the phone. I was like, they're trying to kill me, you know. Did that Monday morning and went into the table read 30 minutes later. I didn't even have time to call my folks and say, I'll go to a TV show, you know. Did you, did, did you have, uh, did you know the accent instinctively? Did you have a coach to help you with it? How did that go? Well, as a young girl, um, we moved to Atlanta when I was seven. And my first teacher was in the third grade. Her name was Miss Pinkard. And that's how she talked. And it took me a while to adjust my ear, you know, to... There were several different Southern accents down there. You know, the black kids had a way of speaking. The white people had a way of speaking. And then there was a kind of neutral tone down there. I imitated the hell out of everybody I met, you know. I made little tapes of all my different characters and... I had this little um, scene where a white girl and a black girl in the bathroom doing their hair, and they're having this whole conversation about their hair. You put grace on your hair? Oh, my Lord, I could never do that. My scalp's too oily. Well, damn, girl, I couldn't comb it if I didn't put no grace on it. And then I'd put the alarm clock on, and that would be the bell to go to class. And I flushed the toilet, you know, had little sound effects. So actually, that's where Whitley's accent came from. Oh, my gosh. I wish I had studied a little bit more because Whitley's from Virginia. I'm slightly different, but, it, you know, it worked. Did you ever take any heat for your accent? Did anybody ever say, think that it was unreal? Um, I caught heat twice. One from an actor who said, you know, Southern people don't talk like that. You know, and then um, I thought I'd take heat because... Black people didn't talk like that. I, I deliberately chose a white Southern accent because I thought it was funnier. There was no other reason. Then after Whitley became this real person with a background that I had to justify, I said she grew up with white people. And Hillman was her first black experience, which also explained for a lot of other behaviors that didn't fit in. So it, it worked to my benefit towards the end. No, I, quite to my dismay, I met people that knew Whitley, that went to school with Whitley's, and I thought I had made her up. How much of, um... I went to Martha's Vineyard one summer, and I met a Whitley, and I stared at her through the whole conversation. Her whole conversation was all about this world that I knew nothing of personally, but that Whitley would have grown up in with the horses and the tennis lessons and the Jack and Jill club and the exclusivity of the upper black middle class. And I was like, that was, that was a real awakening for me that this girl really existed. How did you grow up? I grew up kind of, well, middle class, but I went to some poor schools. I went to, you know, I was bused to um, white schools in the first year of Eminem minority to majority busing. And so I ended up going to school with kids from the projects and school school with a mixture of classes. And um, I guess that's why my ear was developed for the different ways that people spoke. But um, I had heard of, you know, the exclusive, the exclusive kind of debutante thing that happens in the South, but 
my mom's from New England and she just would have no part of r Southern rituals. You know, she was anti-ritual, slightly feminist, couldn't do the beauty pageants, couldn't do the, you know, the spectacle of the South. So, it, you know, we're talking about the 70s, too, where she's very much about her causes. So I knew of it, but I didn't experience it. Kind of had more of an earthy type background. How'd your mom react when she saw Whitley? Well, she was with me when I read <laughs> my sides to her and she thought it was funny. But once I got it and I did about five episodes, she said, oh God, I wish you didn't have to talk like that anymore. She's totally unrealistic. It's interesting because a lot of what you brought to the character, you know, made it into the series. Could you sort of talk a little bit about, because one of the things that we are going to be exploring is the creative process and how reality impacts on a storyline of a TV show. Um, and in this particular case, what does the actor bring to the character that evolves the character? It's interesting because I had no television experience. I was coming from the theater where you're true to the script and you're true to the choreography and you come on time and you are a vessel for the creative process. Where, um, but, So I was thrown a little bit in, in TV land where um, in the first year we were pretty much um, kids do what we tell you to do. And um, it wasn't a happy set. And I felt um, like um, as one of the senior members, because, you know, the cast was relatively young. Lisa Bonet had just come from um, Cosby with the most experience for television. But I, I always felt she should have had more voice as to who she felt Denise Huxtable was at this time in her life. So I was disappointed in the lack of interaction, but I accepted it as maybe this is how they do it out here. Um, and my gig was always, you know, how do I make this fly? How do I make this believable? Because I had unbelievable moments, you know, and, and I always felt that Whitley was neurotic and broad. So how do you do that and still stay real? So until we aired, I really didn't know if this was working or not, you know, and I would say things like, you know, Whitley parked in the handicap when she shot because, you know, it was easier. And, and um, I remember Lisa Bonet's character looks at me like, what? And I said, well, why should I be punished? Because I can walk. And I was like, God, this girl really says some horrible things. How am I going to get away with this, you know? So I had to find a way to embrace her first, you know, and not place my own personal opinion and political judgments on her because she was pretty much against everything I was coming from. You know, our apartheid show, she said, you know, why should I worry about those people? I don't even know them. You know, so everything that Whitley said I felt was the antithesis of what I believed, but I had faith in the show that there were enough characters and strong voices on the show to counter Whitley's. Um, right. I don't know if that answers your question. It kind of does. Was it difficult so, for you as, as an intelligent human being to sort of mouth these politically incorrect? And, and the two shows that come to my memory are um, that were difficult for me politically, but um, this one show was difficult for everyone. It was a show that Debbie Allen was very passionate about. She wanted to, t uh, to show that we should embrace what has been made a joke of the black culture. And she used the mammy figure as an example of what has been made a joke, but is really the pillar and the strength of, of our culture and the American culture. And, um, Charnel Brown, um, was wrapped in um, like a, a head, head rag and then kind of that peasant blouse that you'd see, you know, Aunt Jemima in. But then as we, we roll her out, she become, we roll her in this gold fabric and she becomes a beautiful queen at the end of this number. And we're producing a number for our, our fictitious college, but that was touchy. It was touch, touchy because 
um, as I felt in School Days, which was a movie I did with Spike Lee about intra-racial tension between dark and light-skinned Blacks, it just brought up a lot of baggage for people. And I always find that I'm on the side that um, I have always avoided. I have never been one. I never felt I was better than. I wasn't raised with that lighter skin hierarchy in my family. Yet I find I'm always those girls that people have been confronted with all their lives. Those girls that, you know, people envied, little girls envied in grade school. Um, and then, but my experience was maybe the envy was there, but I always countered it and I never believed it. And I also came up after, you know, I came up with Black is Beautiful. I wanted an Afro. So contrary to these um, mores of the 30s and 40s and 50s with the paper bag test and all that, I always felt that I was too light and not enough, not brown enough, not curly enough, not, you know, so it, ne it was never me, you know, um, and the assumptions that are made when people look at me that that is me, oh, that, that would hit a chord for me. It's like, you know, and I remember deliberately not playing parts after that. Like I really had enough between school days and a different world and then Queen I really had enough of portraying that hierarchy that I didn't feel. Um, and then for Charnel, it was deep. It was a deep experience. It was like, Mammy, don't nobody want to play Mammy. And Debbie was so, you know, Debbie has a collection of uh, memorabilia. And I, I have another girlfriend who has an African-American collection of all of those, you know, soap ads and you know, the, the coons with the big lips and the, you know, and I was like, why do y'all want to look at this? What is the, and that show was to teach us how to, it's like taking back the N word to, to get rid of the power and to get rid of the joke and look at the culture for what it really was and the foundation of American history. But it was a, it was a touchy show to play. It was, it wasn't particularly fun that week. And another one was probably the apartheid show. Let's talk about the um, evolution of the show a little bit, because the show went from being a show about Lisa Bonet. She left the show and you started to take center stage in a, in a huge way. Um, could you sort of walk me through that process? What happened when Lisa left, why she left, how, how that happened and how that impacted the show? Well, um, the first season of the show and also, uh, you know, remember my ignorance of the medium and how things worked. Um, I was just always sure that it wasn't going to go like we get our pink slips like we do on Broadway and the show's closing. I had a seven episode contract. So around episode six, I'm wondering if I'm going to be there or not. Um, and then at the end of the season, we w were wondering if we're being picked up or not. And um I felt personally based on the first season that we were not going to get picked up. There was a lot of problems on the set. I felt the show was trite. Um, it did not reflect a black campus. Um, you know, my, I come from a Morehouse college family. I grew up across the street from Morehouse and I just knew it. And um, I, I felt it wasn't deep enough and I felt the talent was underutilized. But aside from what I felt, because nobody asked me, um, <laughs> so summer, you know, that hiatus period of waiting, um, you know, Lisa found out she was pregnant. She gave me a call and we were excited. And, um, but then I was sure the show would be canceled. And I believe from what I remember and from what I heard that Cosby did want to integrate her pregnancy into the show, but the network did not. And I, you know, it, I felt that would have been fabulous. I mean, it would have eliminated a lot of the trite problem. And it would have dealt with a segment of society where women are struggling, having these babies really early, but still wanting to get their education. I just thought it would have given the great depth to our comedy. Um, but they didn't do that. So they put Lisa back on um, 
the Cosby show, as you know, and um, and Debbie Allen was brought on as a producer and director of the show. And she changed not only the tone of the show, she made some dramatic changes from the first season. And she called me because I knew I knew Debbie. I had done fame, um, the television series. And she said, OK, we're going to um, hook you and Dwayne up. But I thought it was a terrible idea. I was like, well, that's lazy. How obvious and not obvious. I mean, what, what, what the hell do they have in common? Other than, I, you know, Kadeem and I came on the show at the same time. I didn't see any. It was such a reach to me that Whitley, because the way Dwayne was in the first season was like a little kid with a big crush on Denise. And Whitley seemed like she'd be going out with someone who was already out of college. You know, I don't know. So um, they started that second season with the dreaming about Dwayne. And um, I really, I, I, I went to Kadeem, who was my friend and, and very much like, you know, a younger brother to me. And I said, you know, I'm not buying it. If I don't buy it, I can't play it. You know? That's my phone, I think. Is that bothering? Can you hear it? Okay. So um, I said, we got to work on this. First of all, we need sexual tension. Because I'd walk in the room and he'd be eating and he'd never look up from his potato chips or something. I'm like, you're supposed to like me. When I walk in, you got to, you know, give me some eye contact. Like the stuff in between the lines. And... um and because of our relationship, you know, like this big sister, little brother thing, he wouldn't really take over. You know, he didn't want to offend me and get in my, my boundary zone because I was kind of tough cookie about things. And I was like, look, you're going to have to grab me and kiss me because this is, I, you know, you got to be more aggressive and let that man thing come out. And, um, and, and we really worked on it. And Consequently, it made us so much closer. I mean, we have a completely honest relationship with each other, and I trusted him completely with my work. You know, Kadeem, is this working? And what am I, how come this isn't funny? And I knew he would tell me the truth. And also, it made that Dwayne and Whitley thing happen. And um, I'm always like that, though. I got to believe it first. And I was asked to do some things on that show I did not believe. I didn't want to do that graduate wedding ending. <laughs> oh, no, don't marry her. I was like, how corny is that? Every, you know, and it worked and the audience loved it. But, you know, final episodes are always kind of kinky, you know, because you want to know that there's light beyond that, that, that doesn't end. Mm -hmm. How was that final episode? doing that was it emotional was it tough was it you you, you were railing against the wedding or... the wedding episode was a double episode and really you know took you through the journey of you know what what a woman bride goes through the night before and and what Dwayne was going through watching somebody else marry Whitley and um I think it was a great culmination of that series because it was saying goodbye to the show in a way that you do at a graduation. We're going into another phase of our lives. And we had really exhausted the campus. And, and it would have been, you know, we would have been 50-year-old sweat hogs, basically. Not that that bothered me when I watched that show. But after a while, you know, the time thing, I think we could have maybe moved on with Whitley and Dwayne and their married lives, but I really didn't want to talk like that anymore and wanted to explore the things. I feel I'm not a big um, romantic in that girly kind of way, you know? I didn't care for watching Miss America pageants and the way I never fantasized about weddings and what to wear, and it was just, again... So odd. Here I am trying to pick out a wedding dress. There's this energy around me from the writers and the producers. They're really excited. And I was like, I'm not really getting married. <laughs> the set was getting, this was like, we're going to their wedding. You know? 
And you're like, and I just have outer body experiences sometimes playing Whitley. And um, it was, I loved working with Joe Morton, who was the other man, but Kadeem didn't like other men on the set. He liked being the head cheese. And it was really funny when other men came on, you know, it was okay with Daryl Bell because it was his sidekick and his boy. But anybody else, he loved being the testosterone in the group. About Sinbad when he came on. Didn't they, he didn't do the, uh, you know, but heads with Sinbad, I think, because we were all in there together. But those guest stars, he really, I was like, you're, you're being kind of mean, you know? And then in the dressing room, I was having trouble with one of the scenes with, with Joe because we were dealing with some heavy issues and I wanted to still stay as Whitley and um, but I didn't want to I was just having trouble mixing the comedy with the depth of what we were talking about and I said to Kadeem you know as I usually did what's up what's going on how come this isn't working he said I think you, you and Joe need to go to the lab and get some chemistry I was like oh bitchy. <laughs> but that was just because he didn't like, you know. So that was always funny to me, you know, because we would have guests. We had a lot of wonderful guests and that new male energy, the lion and Kadeem would come out. Interestingly enough, and maybe you could talk about the parallels between this, you were all of a certain age. I mean, you weren't necessarily college age, but you were all in that age where people sort of go through College is a time of, of evolution for people. People are not the same when they're in the freshman year as they are in their senior year. And in a similar way, all your characters sort of had their arcs. Mm -hmm. So you got to sort of do that and play that, which also made the, um, the, 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 the relationship sort of almost, you can make it work because they're all of this, these formative years. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the evolution of those characters? And especially your character, how she changed over, over time and how she had to change becoming the central character. I think um, the friendships were very important to the dynamics of the group. And um, one, I don't know what season we were in, four, four or five, but they wanted to change Freddie's character. So they made Cree blow dry her hair and wear heels. And Whitley basically gave her an extreme makeover. And, um, you know, her beautiful curly hair was now straight and she had on pumps and I had to teach her how to walk and everything on and off camera. But I think I, I was like, I don't know that she would have changed that drastically. Like I know 50 year old Freddie's, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that was the trick, not to go too far one way or the other from who they really are. And I feel that they knew who Whitley was. They knew she'd, you know, be an art dealer or work in a gallery or not. You know, she's not going to just all of a sudden get her hands dirty. Um, and, you know, with Charnel's character, um, Kim Reese being a doctor, and I felt that progression, and then the relationships, you know, the love relationships, and um, really see a lot of growth to me, and probably because it, I, I'm looking at it, and it's not me, it's probably in the Dwayne Wayne character. I mean, if you look at his character from the first season to the sixth, where he's an assistant professor, and um, how seriously he started to take life once he fell in love with Whitley, I think is a, is a, it's a beautiful arc and it's real. And it happened kind of in a concise way because he was still a young man, but he stopped messing around. You know, he stopped. Um, everything wasn't a joke, whereas Ron kind of stayed like that. You know, it's like that character in Sideways. He just never grew up. Good. Yeah, good movie. How much of um, how much of Bill Cosby's influence did you feel on the on the set? Was was his was his sort of? I know he was in New York, and you guys were in L.A., but was his hand creatively in there that you that you saw? Cosby was the whiz. You know, he was the whiz in the land of Oz that made all the decisions, but you didn't see him that much. But everything passed through Cosby and Alvin Poussaint. And I know that for a fact because I wrote three episodes and they all had to go through 
you know, Debbie and uh, Susan Fales, the head writer, Alvin Poussant and Cosby. So, um, and Cosby fought for us. We were on and I, I felt the most respect that the show got was because of Cosby and that no one gave the show its own props for being number two, number one, number three in the six years that we were. And um, always, you know, we'll look at their time slot and um, look who comes before them and who comes after them. And um, it, it, it was a fun, it was funny for me to watch, you know, from a business perspective and, um, and kind of envious that we were there. But I, I feel it was a good show. And that um, we got a lot of help and we needed that help from Cosby. I think I, I don't think they would have uh, kept us there. There was also an educational component. I, I would guess uh, Diane Carroll spoke to us and said, told us about the morning calisthenics. Well, tell us about that. Debbie made us work out every morning. And it was, you know, stretches and crunches and jumping jacks and um and she believed, and, you know, she's a, a dancer first, always, that it, you know, brings us together. Because coming to the set and just getting your coffee and going to the trailer and not seeing the people you work with until the scene is an odd thing. And I, I didn't experience that until after I left A Different World, that I, I, I would feel alone and cut off. And it was harder for me to interact with people I didn't know as well. Um, and that's also a theater background. You're going to kind of live with those people for two months before you start to perform. But film and television, that's not necessary. So Debbie made sure we had that as a communal thing. And she also believed it got our energy up, you know. Um, what did you believe? <laughs> so let's talk some more about the uh, morning exercises. Well, you know, I'm, I was a dancer, so I came from that, and I was used to just following instruction. But part of me was like, God, I'm an actor now. I don't feel like stretching before rehearsal. I've been doing this, you know, for 10 years. Um, but I did it, and I was always on time. And um, it was, you know, Debbie is a very hard worker, and you have to work at her level when you work with her. And... But she's funny as hell. So it was always fun. And it was also a time to find out what people did over the weekend. And, you know, um, and Debbie had a thing about being late. But Debbie is harder on her women than her men. OK. And the boys would always come in late, Kadeem and Daryl. And uh, one day we were stretching and um, I noticed that Daryl was timing it to come in right at the end of the warm up. Like, how convenient. And I, I finally, I just, I said, look, um, no, I was, we were bouncing over and said, I, I just want to know why some of us have to be on time and other people don't. In the hush fell over Jerusalem. I don't think, did, I don't know if we, Daryl and I spoke for a while after that. But, you know, then Debbie was like, what? What's wrong with you, Miss Thing? I said, Debbie, you know, none of us want to stretch and be be doing this, you know? How come Daryl gets to come in? And, you know, and that kissing and loving and, you know, rest of us girls. But that, that warm-up was very familial. I mean, we had that kind of tone on the set. How did she introduce that? I mean, you had your first season and there was none of that. Then Debbie Allen comes out. How does that? She introduced it with everything else she introduced. Um, along with Debbie came a new flavor and feeling. You know, having gone to Howard University, she was like, look, the pit is going to serve greens and cornbread and Southern cooking. And Mr. Gaines is going to be like your father and your grandfather figure. This is what we had at Howard. It wasn't a cold place to go to school. Um, she also brought in a different technique of working. God, the first season, we would do things maybe 13 times, which for me, I was just, I had no experience in doing that many takes. And 
I did everything like you were performing it on stage. So I never, you know, I didn't change. I didn't know why we were doing it again. I, ne I never knew what the hell was going on, basically. And we would be there till one in the morning on tape days. And she came in. Let me just say our work weeks turned into four day weeks instead of five. And we got out at 10 o'clock every tape night. One take. If we got it, why do it again? And so we were very proficient. And uh, we didn't count on, oh, well, well, we'll do it again so I can mess up that line or I won't give it my all. We also um, rehearsed at a certain level, too, that wasn't going on in the first season. You know, um, it was kind of that turn it on for the camera mentality in the first season. And um, Debbie doesn't work like that. And um, I just want to tell this little story. Please. Because of this one take, setting that we were all used to. Um, I was used to doing things in one take, especially if I nailed it, the audience loved it. You know, I, I'm, I'm almost out of my clothes by the time they're going, we're going to do it again. And this one time, um, it, was, it was Whitley's birthday. And uh, the episode is, and everyone's acting like they forgot. And um, so Whitley's alone with the bottle of Bordeaux and some pizza talking to Denzel Washington photo on her bulletin board, which she takes from the bulletin board and punches in a pillow and makes, you know, well, half life-size Denzel out of it. And as she's, you know, getting drunk, she's getting more and more into Denzel. And she says, you know, make me call my name. Make me call your name. Denzel. Denzel. Well, first of all, getting drunk, being infatuated with this, I really went for it because I didn't want to do it again. And I really didn't think it'd be funny again. And she made me do it again. I usually don't question Debbie, but I said to the stage manager, why? You know, what, what's the problem? I'm thinking I'll get a note to adjust. And she, I get back from the stage manager, the problem with the lighting. I like go back I, and I said well, I'm going to go for it even more because the audience has already seen it so I really got drunk this time you know and I really fell in love with Denzel and I was so focused and the audience was cracking up you know and there was this energy going on and um, in the scene the girls walk in on me in this embarrassing situation with Denzel's photograph and I turn around and try and cover it up. So I get the tap on the shoulder and I turn around and it's Denzel. And I, I still to this day don't know if I've had quite that reaction ever. I thought I was seeing a ghost. I went like, you know, I crawled back from him. I thought maybe I focused so hard. I saw Denzel in Don Lewis's face. And then when I realized it was the real Denzel, I was mortified. You know, I was like, oh, my God, I don't want him to see me like this. And I just freaked out. And then, um, you know, Debbie's over in the corner just cracking you. Oh, oh, I'm good. And Denzel's like, are you OK? And I'm like, talk to you. Yeah, don't touch me. And then he hugged me. I'm like, oh, he's hugging me. You know, I was so torn between love and humiliation, embarrassment, and done, you know. But um, that's what comes from, you know, taking your takes for granted. You never know why you're doing it again. And that was why. Well, that wasn't the way I wanted to meet that man. Let me just say that. Ah. And what best story I've heard so far is doing this show. I have a tape of it. Really? Can we use it? Probably. Why not? I love Unless Denzel it. says no. Yeah, well, we'll get him to see. It's so funny. Me and my sister just rerun it and rerun it because you see me kind of crawling up the bed. Oh. It freaked me out. When I was like, that shit ain't funny, Debbie. Everybody was laughing so much. And, you know, Debbie and Denzel are friends. And I'm like, God, I must look like such a, 
don't know. You know, it was my idea that Whitley was in love with Denzel. You know, and it's no stretch. Let me just say that, you know, the girl would be in love with Denzel. But Jasmine didn't want to meet Denzel, like, you know, slobbering over him. You know, I don't want to be a little cool when I meet him. Yeah, you weren't so cool. I was, oh, no, it wasn't cool at all. And I had on this goofy taffeta green dress. How did he react afterwards? He says, you can hear him on the tape going, you were so scared, you scared me. I think they expected a reaction like, oh, my God, I did sell. But it freaked me out so bad that it, you know, he was like, well, maybe I don't want to give her a heart attack, you know, and back up a little bit. But, you know. How'd they get him there? Who got him there? Debbie. You know, Debbie is, she's a prankster. That's why I said you will always have fun working with Debbie Allen. You're going to work, but you always have fun. Yeah, she got me a stripper for my birthday on, my, on the set. I was like, thanks, Debbie. My Put first stripper. For you, though. No. <laughs> that would have been good. Uh, he waited till Ricochet. Yes. Oh, my God. You made my day. Um, did De- Debbie implemented a spring trip to Atlanta for the writers? Did everybody go, or is that just a... Um, the writers went. We didn't go. Tell but, yeah. That. You were too- I, I don't know. I don't know that much about it. I just know that I was happy because, basically, you know, even some of our Black writers hadn't gone to Black colleges. You need to be there. You need to feel it, you know. Um... This this always amazes me about white folk. For some reason, they think they know everything about everybody. But everybody doesn't think they know everything about you. Like, um, if you were to say to me, I went to a Jewish academy or I, went, I go to temple every week, I wouldn't know what that means. I know what it means in words. I wouldn't be able to write about it without experiencing it, without doing my research. Um, And I give credence to other cultures that I don't know about. But I feel like with black folk, white people think they just, okay, just change the names and make them black. There's a different texture that was missing in the show. And it's hard to play colorless or bland or, you know, the, the reason why Whitley, I believe, was so, you know, g- grabbed people is she was so definitive. Whether it was likable or not wasn't what was going on with Whitley in the beginning. She was defined. And I felt sorry for a- the actors that were struggling with finding a voice for these characters and the voice changing every week. You know, Miss Marissa Tomei. Oh, she's smart. Oh, she's daffy. And, and, you know, I, I can't speak for her, but I remember going, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm the bitch and I'm naughty and I come in, I drop the bomb and I leave. I, my gig is clear, you know, and all I had to do is make that work. But to have um, like on camera trials, I think was very difficult for the show. And Debbie came in and gave definition to where we lived, where we were from who who we were, where we came from, you know. And if you if you notice, you know, Freddie was a defined character. You knew what to expect from her. You knew what to expect from Kimberly Reese. You knew what to expect from Mr. Gaines, you know. So it made for a more familiar place. It didn't matter that it was black, but it was because it was defined, it was more believable. How much did uh the casting of Diane Carroll as your mother help you define your character. That intimidated me to be the daughter of Diane Carroll. First of all, I love Diane Carroll and um, I love her work and I really fell in love with her and Claudine. Um, but, you know, she is a beauty and she is together all the time. I just acted like I was. And I knew that, but I felt in some way she would be disappointed that I wasn't, I wasn't pulled together like that. 
And, um, you know, what a joy to know that she could have cared less and how warm and intelligent and grateful she was. I mean, it was profound to have her on the show. And she, after her first episode, um, had a magnum of champagne for us and said, I never thought I would be around this many Black people and women on a set. I was always the only one. And you all are so bright and so confident. I never thought this would happen, and I'm here to see it. She told me she, that was the one thing that surprised her, to see all of you working together. And she said it was, she said that, that, um, that Debbie Allen turned it into a real educational experience for you guys. Debbie Allen, um, who I've always claimed as a mentor, um, encouraged us to write for the show, direct, get, get in those unions, utilize this experience. Debbie knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime deal. And no matter what we get from the outside world about it, are you getting what you can from the inside? And I've learned that from her. And it's also a lesson I learned when I was at Alvin Ailey's that you can bitch and complain about not being in the first company and you didn't get this role, but are you wearing the role out that you have? Is what you're doing phenomenal? And I always remind myself of that because we were discounted a lot. And um, I would say, especially as I've watched television and television stars over the year, years and the kind of attention and glory they get, um, I feel like we were kind of stepchildren treated in that way. But it didn't affect me because I had pride of the show. I was really very focused on the crew, who I saw every day, who worked with us, the writers that would come to our dressing rooms and go, this is what I'm doing next week. Tell me if you like it. What do you think? What, what do you think would happen here? The opportunities I had to cross that, that wall and sit in with the writers and hear what they really say about us how they all act our parts out. I'm like, wow, I didn't know y'all did all this. Oh my God, they, the writers would convene after every rehearsal. So we go home at four o'clock and they're there till 10 at night writing with each other. And they're acting out all the parts. You know, one guy's doing Sinbad, somebody's doing Whitley, the other one's doing Dwayne. I'm like, oh, y'all are pretty good, you know. Um, the, the chance to write on that show, you know, waiting to see if your stuff is funny and to see if the actors are happy with their parts and to make sure the script isn't self-serving, you know, part of why I wanted to write was that I got a, a chance to make other people do things I wanted to see them do. You know, we had so much fun off camera. It was a hugely talented show. You know, and I was like, ah, I want to see this happen. And, you know, it was really, um, I loved, I loved that part, being able to do that there and having Debbie behind me. I never feared. I knew I was in a safe and protected zone to learn, you know, and to grow. Um, and Debbie introduced me to, to Hollywood. How so? You know, we would go to parties at George's, which was co-owned by Norm Nixon and Denzel. And, you know, there would always be some fame dancers there. So I would know them and there would always be different world people. And there, there would be people from everything Debbie's ever done. She leaves no one behind. But then there'd be Denzel and Quincy Jones. And you know what I'm saying? It was like access just to everyone. And it didn't have that key on protocol. Oh, she's just on a sitcom. Oh, he's just a dancer. Oh, we would just all party together. And that was because of Debbie. We just stop for one second. 
hilarious to me. I don't know if it was for her, Georgette, from Mary Tyler Moore. I'm starting to start over. One time you... Um, one time on the plane um, going, you know, between L.A. and New York, I sat next to Georgette from the Mary Tyler Moore show. I was just so, you know, I was like this, and then I had to act kind of normal, let her have her space. But I said, damn, if anybody walks down the aisle and sees Whitley and Georgette sitting together, that would, that would be weird. It's like, where does the line, you know? I always wanted to see some sort of show that would cross over all TV characters with each other, you know, to see how they would react in their different universes. Oh. So, uh oh. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, okay, don't... We'll put you on the move. We'll do a little task. Yeah, especially, with, like, you know, when the characters are that defined and right. you know what they're like, um, like Betty White from Mary Tyler Moore, that oh, character. I her. Love her, too. How, how would that be? Sue Ann Nivens and Whitley. Yeah. Monica. Whitley would love Sue Ann Nivens. Yeah, she would idolize Sue Ann Nivens. She'd want to be her, don't you think? Without question, except... I don't think Sue Ann Nivens would like... I don't know. Except for the slut part. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting she played a slut. What can you imagine? You know, because the Golden, Golden Girls audience knows nothing about that. Well, you know, she was originally supposed to play Rue McClanahan's her. Oh. I did um, Vagina Monologues with Rue. Yeah? Oh, my God. She's so good. She is straight. Yeah. And she, she also, another one with the uh, phony accent. Yeah. On the show. That she don't talk. Completely. Okay. And I heard Betty White didn't, wouldn't do vagina monologues. She right. thought it was too yeah. risque. Yeah. I was like, for that? How? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, what, so what are those stories that you're telling me about? Those, those stories that you don't want to go home and regret not telling? Well, I, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, how important Diane Carroll and Debbie Allen. I mean, Debbie Allen is pivotal to me to this entire story. Debbie Allen fought for things. She fought for... Um, it's hard because I don't think the general audience... Well, you know what? They do get it because the corporate world is like this. I watched The Apprentice. I was like, that's the same bulls that we go through. You know, the way, the way you're judged, the way anything new is is scrutinized you know the way we wanted to talk about apartheid now this let me just say this is before nelson mandela is released everyone's talking about it we're not oh. growing pains talks about it and we don't we have to fight to have an apartheid show an anti-apartheid show on a different world that is the subject on black campuses divestment this is so that always amazed me you know when debbie would say girl they didn't want to do this i thought like, you had to fight for this this is so organic this is ours to tell you know um the aids episode huge fight to do an aids epi episode and now aids is affecting more black women than anybody okay so, you know, 12 years ago, we're trying to do an aid story about a black woman that's getting it. Even when at that time, it was mostly gay men that you heard about. Had to fight for it. We had to have Whoopi Goldberg on our show to get that done. And Bill, too, fighting. Um, and that always amazed me, like, why do we have to fight so hard to be good? Don't you guys want us to be good and poignant? I had an exec tell me once, we don't care how poignant you are as long as Whitley and Dwayne are the main storyline. I said, well, that's the truth for them, but I really took pride in the setting and the fact that enrollment went up because of the school in black colleges and that people saw Hillman as an option, that kids saw Hillman as, oh, I could do that. You know, and, you know, I grew up on good times. I wanted to live in Cabrini Green. So I'm glad that, you know, this generation had that and that underneath it all, subliminally, they got a message, whether it was about education or not that week. And a lot of times it wasn't. You know, a lot of times we were just having fun or, you know, trying to surprise Whitley for her birthday. 
But you're on that long with that many people watching, 20, 30 million people a week. Why not try to be your best? Tell me something that you'd only know if you were there. If you watch the show, you'd never know it. If you were, you know, if you worked in the industry, you'd never do it. But you were there. There's something weird, funny, stupid, poignant, something that you'd only know if you were on that set. Hmm. I can do that with NYPD Blue. Do it. I played um, the the wife of a of a drug dealer who was incarcerated on NYPD Blue, and the show opens um, with these two uh, young dead children and no parents, and um, they find out that the mother has jumped out of the window. And it turns out that there was a robbery and somebody was coming to find money that was hidden in the apartment that the wife knew nothing of. Well, I took this role, which was only one scene, because I liked that it showed a struggling urban woman with criminal ties that loved her kids. So I get on the set. And um, after I, after they made me up and I was all beat up from jumping out of the window and dealing with the, um, the thieves, and they put this huge neck brace on me, so I was like this, and I had a cast and my foot was up. It would have been funny had we been on a different world because it was just that much. I looked terrible. I kept looking in the mirror like, damn, this is good because it was such, it was beautiful. And I'm in the in the thing, the gurney. They're coming down, and and Jimmy Smiths and Den Fran, Dennis Franz come in, and they interrogate me on my way in. And um, Jimmy's calm, cool, and collected. And Dennis is implying that I didn't tell them where the money was, and I let my kids get shot, which inflames me. And um, I say, you know, you don't think I love my kids. I didn't know where that money was. So we do that a couple of times. And then the director comes up to me and says, this really got to me. Okay, we, um, we don't want you to say this line. There was only one line in it that implied that I didn't know where the money was. They wanted me to take it out. And I'm like, if I take that line out, then it's going to look like she knew where the money was. Yeah, they just want to try it that way. I said, well, I don't want to try it that way. That's what I only took this part because of that line. And I said, do you know everybody black on this show is just despicable? The people that killed my kids, my husband in jail, you know, why do I have to be despicable? And what, what are you talking about? What animal are you talking about? You have this whole discussion. And it was a female director who was a mother who had just pumped me up to be emotional when I say, you think I didn't love my kids. So I'm all crying and angry. And then you come back and take and say, now tell me I did, you know, and I knew it wasn't coming from her. Um, and then they took my makeup down so I didn't look as beat up. And then... So here are the two things that people wouldn't have known unless they were there. One, that I was told to change that direction, and I refused. Two, that Jimmy Schmitz had them take that big-ass neck brace off of me because he was like, we can't even see her, you know? And they put on a smaller brace, which is not technically used for the kind of injury I had, but you could see. I mean, literally, I was like, (laughs) And then my head was wrapped. So quite the star turd. Yeah, because Jimmy Smith was the star of this show. I mean, he was very much like Prince Charming for me at that moment. That he stood up for the guest on the show, you know, who had one scene. And they listened too. They got my thing, you know. But it was also not something I could have asked for, you know. Plus I'm battling with the line thing. Anyway. The ending of the story is they took the line out anyway in editing, no matter how I played that scene, and it still had the implication that I knew where the money was. 
They can do whatever they want in editing. The power of the director and the editor. Wait till you see what I did. <laughs> well, my boobs are going to be out to here. Oh, <laughs> Fix it and pass. We'll get her some. <laughs> um, let's see. I've, I've covered most of it, and I think we're actually I'm running over to fix. Okay. But is there anything else that we've missed? That uh, no, I think we're good. Oh, Jasmine, thank you so much. I could go on for half an hour. That was so much fun, and I really love your idea. Don't steal it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just gonna. T- don't tell too many people either. 